first speaker has over 10 years of experience as a producer, designer, and manager. He's founded studios, led design teams, and is currently working as a producer at Funcom on their flagship title, June Awakening. So he's here to share his tips with you on how to help your team succeed. So please welcome Ulla Andreas Halle. Thank you so much. Uh, can you all hear me in the back? Awesome. All right. Hello. My name is Ulla Andreas, and I work as a producer at Funcom. Uh, and I'm super happy to be here and speak uh, to you at Console and to be surrounded by so many uh, fantastic and kind people. My talk today is about how you can, tell, can help your team succeed, focusing mainly on production topics since that's what I do. Uh, just a little bit about my journey to begin with so that you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, in 2011, I graduated uh, in Lanna University College, specializing in game programming, but it's a pretty general course. In uh, right after bachelor's, me and a few uh, other students at that school started Quillbyte Studio, where I worked as a CEO and a producer, and a few other hats, because in a small studio, you have many hats usually. Uh, which is a contrast to my job today, which I'm going to get to. Uh, where we shipped Among the Sleep, The Plan, and a few other uh, cool games. And then in 2015, I co-founded educational game startup Capiche, uh, where I was the head of product. And I later moved on to uh, Red Thread Games, joining them as lead producer in uh, 2020, and last year, in 2021, I joined Funcom as a producer. So that's kind of my journey. And I do talks like this, and lectures, and, and uh, I'm part of some board, uh, 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 board roles and stuff like that as well. And I live in Oslo with my wife and two cats, which you can see there. Uh, on the left is Boo, and on the right is Peach. Just a little bit about Funcom, so you kind of have a framing for, uh, for, for, for this talk. Um, so Funcom is uh, in a period of growth, and has been growing quite a bit lately. We're 400 plus people right now, worldwide, and we have studios in Oslo, which is our headquarters. That's where I work, in Stockholm, in Bucharest, in Lisbon, and uh, North Carolina. And we also have uh, partner studios that we collaborate with. This is a little video I wanted to show you uh, about some of the, like, how we work, how we play at uh, Funcom in Oslo. So I just want to share that as well. I'm so proud of working there and for the, the fantastic team that I'm working with. It's uh, truly an amazing place to work. Uh, and we're quite uh, well represented here. We have seven people from Funcom here. Uh, some of them, I think, are wearing Funcom hoodies and clothes. So feel free to uh, come up to us and have a chat uh, as well. All right, let's jump into uh, my talk. Uh, so as we all know, making games is hard. From figuring out what you're making, putting together a team, solving all of the technical difficulties, and so on. 
So I want to chat a little bit about what some takeaways that we can, can uh, do to uh, alleviate some of that stress and overhead, uh, taking that out of the, out of the equation uh, by adding some production tools. So this is uh, from my experience uh, working in indie development, moving into AAA. Uh, I guess because uh, our team is around 300 plus now, I'm not sure where the, the limit is, but it's, it's, a, it's a bit different uh, to what I've been used to. So I, I'm going to share some of that experience. So, but first, I also know that there's 50% students here, so I want to talk a little bit about what a producer does. Uh, at Funcom, I'm a producer for multiple development teams, um, and I'm also uh, a producer for designers, and I have a few other uh, responsibilities. Um, and I get to work with great teams that deliver cool stuff for our game, uh, Dune Awakening, every day, and, uh, and it's an awesome job. So for anybody getting into game dev and are curious about what that means, uh, I'm just going to share a little bit about that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about like production toolbox, uh, things that you can apply to your production and your game development in order to maybe uh, make your job a little bit easier and to be able to, uh, yeah, have uh, have more focus on the game itself. Cool. So moving into what to not expect, we're not going to do any deep dives into project management software, even though I, I, uh, my best friend and worst friend sometimes is Jira. Um, we're not going to talk about design and direction topics. Uh, that's a huge uh, topic in itself. Uh, but production has sometimes also uh, some responsibility there. Um, but we'll touch some on it. And then we're not going to talk about discipline-specific production topics for design, art, and tech. So uh, even though I'm a design producer, I would love to chat more about that at another time and, and share some experience there of what that means. And this is not going to be the perfect answer to anything or a one-size-fits-all solution. So if you can pull something out of this and apply it to your game, that's fantastic. If not, then uh, yeah, hopefully you learned something. So as a producer, uh, first and foremost, you're there for the team. And you're always looking and open for ways to help them out. This can be helping unblock them in the work, organizing team lunches and team uh, building exercises. Uh, it can be um, requesting new equipment, figuring out what they need, uh, allowing them to focus on, uh, on the work at hand and take every other distraction out of the equation, basically. And you're uh, uh, also driven... Oh, sorry. Uh, you're also driven seeing, uh, by seeing your team delivering their best work, contributing to the final game and the player experience in the end. So you should know what the final player experience is as a producer uh, and help the team focus towards delivering this. As we all know, making a game can be quite uh, distracting and, and a huge complex uh, task to do. So helping the team focusing, focusing in on what to deliver is, is a very vital uh, role as a producer. You also need to understand your team's strengths and weaknesses. So uh, if your team is planning on making their next game a multiplayer game and they've never done a multiplayer game before, maybe that's a weakness that we need to, to look into finding solutions for. That might mean that you need to start look, looking for hiring people with that experience, or maybe you need to help uh, uh, scope the product in a way that uh, minimizes that risk and, and helps the team deliver a successful game. Uh, you will also ask a lot of questions as a producer. That's your, uh, one of your main jobs, is uh, why is this, why is that? Uh, do we need this? What is, uh, what is the plan there? Uh, do we know this information? Do we, yeah, all of that. Uh, that's, that's basically a lot of your day. And then making decisions based on those, uh, that information. Sometimes you will have to make uh, decisions with incomplete information. That's okay, uh, but if you, the more you can gather uh, and the, the more informed decision you can make, the better, of course. Um, and then also you're responsible for shipping the game on time with quality. Uh, th this means that you, or this might mean that you have responsibility over the budget and, and delivering your scope. Or you, at least you would have insight and influence over that budget. 
Cool. And then creating frames and structures that people work with uh, is also a responsibility that you have. So uh, together with the team, you'll figure out, okay, what do we need to be able to deliver this game? Do we have, uh, do we have the, the people we need? Do we have a, a process for localization? Do we have uh, people who can test this game? Okay, we're showing this game at the conference next uh, month. Do we have everything we need? And also, like, okay, the regular projection schedule. If you're using Agile, do you have a sprint set up? Do you, do you have a good way to set your sprint goals, etc.? All right, let's jump into production toolbox uh, topic. So, what I'm going to talk about now is a little bit inspired by a book by uh, Richard Lemarchand, who's uh, a fantastic. Uh, he's a professor now, but he was working as a designer on the Uncharted games, and uh, he's a fantastic uh, person with uh, deep knowledge in making games, and he has written a book that's called The Playful Production Process, and I recommend reading that to everyone. So this setup is better suited for games like Uncharted or games uh, similar that are released as standalone finished product, uh, products, so more akin to making films in a way. A lot of games today are live games, like Conan Excels that we, we at Funconf have made, and, and uh, and for those games, you might need a different uh, timeline or uh, split your production up into different project phases. So uh, we at Funcom have a different approach to this, but for this talk, I'll use this because it's, it, it fits a lot with Norwegian projects and it's, it's a, lit, a little bit easier to work with. So let's assume that the timeline here is nine, or sorry, three years uh, from start to end. Um, but even if you're working on a smaller project, uh, if it's like six months and you're doing a school project, like a bachelor, this might, might still be useful for you. So it doesn't matter how long it is, you would uh, probably still be able to uh, get some good use of it. So um, by, helping, by, by splitting up your production into different phases, you basically help your team set some good milestones for each phase. And, and clear deliverables. So you have check-in points for you to be able to uh, to see that you're on the right course and that you're able to deliver uh, what you are uh, planning to deliver. And it also allows you to focus so that you're not spending time on polishing stuff early on, but rather have a, a, a gate where you have to pass before you move on and, and extend uh, your game to the next level. Um, so, in his book, he has uh, a phase he calls ideation. It's, uh, it's, uh, it could, you could call it brainstorming phase uh, or anything like that, but that's, that's probably the most fun phase of making a game, right? That's where you have the, all the crazy ideas and you do prototypes on paper and you throw together some stuff in, in Unity or whatever and then, and then you make it work. Uh, I know in, in Sea of Thieves, I, they did a quick rough prototype in Unity of the entire game. Uh, early on before and tried to prove it out before they moved on to pre-production and actually making the game. So this is a free space for you to be able to explore what you're making without committing too much. Um, but it should count up for around 20% of your total production time. And one of the most important parts of making games is that at the end of each of these milestones, you set your, uh, or sorry, yeah, on, on, at the end of each of these project phases, you set yourself a milestone, a deliverable that you agree on, this is what we're going to deliver. And for, uh, uh, for the uh, ideation phase, what you do want to end up with is what's, your, what's the experience goal for the game at the end of the, the entire project. So you should have a clear idea, two, three, four, five bullet points or a few paragraphs, explaining what the actual game experience is going to be for the player. That's the goal of that project phase. Then you'll move into something we call pre-production, uh, which is kind of where you figure out uh, how you're going to make the game. So you will spend a lot of time here uh, doing uh, quick tests, benchmarks. So uh, one thing that's really early and is really important when making a game is figuring out and identifying your benchmarks early. And by benchmarks, I'll go a little bit into that uh, later. I mean, uh, uh, if you have to make something a lot of times, let's say you have to make uh, 30 levels, 
how much time does it take to make one of the levels, for example? Or if you have to make 40 guns, how much time does it take to make one gun from start to finish in a shippable quality? That's your benchmark. And you need to figure those out because before you go into the next phase, you should have a, a vertical slice or a slice of the game with your known benchmarks, a game design macro, which is your high-level game design, and then your schedule. And you wouldn't figure out your schedule without knowing your benchmarks. So a vertical slice here is kind of like uh, a benchmark as well. So if you imagine a cake, you would have multiple layers in that cake. And by taking one slice of that cake, you would have pretty much the entire uh, composition of that cake uh, in its final form. Just a smaller slice. So then you can figure out how much time it takes to make the entire cake. Moving into full production, which is the biggest bulk of the, uh, the uh, game development process. Uh, this is where having your benchmarks and knowing your numbers will help a lot in figuring out how, how much time this takes. And this is where the bulk of the work is happening. So imagine you're working with um, outsourcers or, or, or people are going to take what you know and make more of it. This is where that kind of uh, falls into place. So if you have that information at this, uh, at when you start full production, that's going to that's gonna be a lot easier. That might also mean that you will have descriptions for the outsourcers to be able to, to make those uh, assets or, or whatever it is you need to, to make in a, in a uh, timely manner. So during full production, you'll have an alpha milestone at 65% approximately. Uh, and then a beta milestone at 80, and that's your uh, goal for full production. Alpha milestone usually means feature complete. After alpha, you wouldn't be adding any features because now you need to start making sure that you wrap up any content. And by content, I mean multiple or more levels, um, more weapons, or, or any polish work to bring it up to the shippable quality that is needed for any of these. And a beta milestone, that's when you're going to be content complete. And basically, your game is done from start to finish. And that's where you have uh, what this book calls post-production. Uh, some people might call it the Polish period. Uh, but basically, this is where you make your game shine. You have your full game you can play for, for, uh, uh, through it from start to finish. But now you know um, what you have, and you can just basically make that. Uh, beautiful and shine as you want. And having this timeline uh, figure out as soon as you can and kind of like get the big beats down will help your team focus and know where to, when to do what uh, parts of the game development process. And, and, uh, and then also when to not, so they don't have to worry about it. And as a producer, you're there to help the team focus, so allowing this to be... Um, visible and communicated to your team is really important. Uh, I'm also guessing uh, now that most people here are familiar with uh, terminology like Agile and Waterfall, and even though I'm not going to talk too much about it, uh, as I said in the beginning, there's no one-size-fits-all one solution. Uh, so if you work in Agile or Waterfall, uh, it will probably change throughout, throughout the, the project phase. And usually a game becomes a little bit more waterfall in towards production and in production because you kind of know what you're going to do, so you just kind of like do it. Yes, uh, a little bit about how we define our deliverables. So as, a, as, make, uh, as you make a game and you're in the ideation phase and you try and figure out what you're going to make, um, you need to start with your player experiences at the end of the project. And uh, for me, that's been a huge learning uh, as well. Like, okay, what are, what is your target experience for the player? Figuring that out, so you don't start with like one feature, making that really nice. I mean, that that can be done in the start, in the ideation phase. But f when you come out of that ideation phase, phase, you need to know what the player experience is going to be at the end of the project, because you want to work your way down from that and then backwards. So. Um, as you figured out what your core player experiences is, uh, are, or and, and then your pillars, so what is important for your game? Do you have any? Uh, do you have any um, 
core pillars that you really want to focus on in the game. So uh, that might be that uh, exploration is really important for you, or um, combat is really important for, for you, or I don't know, it, it can be whatever your game uh, uh, game is, but, but yeah, that's if you know those at the top, it's going to make you a lot easier to try and break your way down. And then you can divide that core ex uh, player experience into, uh, experiences into further core player experiences, and then you can start figuring out what falls early and what falls li uh, late in the production, and where your milestones are. And one thing that you really want to figure out is what's, what's your major risks. So going back to that uh, multiplayer game that, uh, that somebody wanted to make but have never made a multiplayer game, that sounds like a risk. So let's try and figure out how we're going to solve that risk early. So maybe that should be a part of an earlier milestone, some sort of R&D. OK, let's try and see if we can make this. So if you're making a multiplayer game about uh, two people, physics-based, uh, fighting with some uh, uh, bananas or something, OK, then let's figure out how that's going to work before we, before we uh, move on and if we can actually deliver uh, Steam connection lobby making yeah people fight with bananas. So. Um, so figure out your major risks, and this, all this will help you manage your scope of the game, because now you can always ask yourself the question that when somebody has a brilliant idea or we have something that takes more time than, than you expected, uh, do we need to, uh, to remove something, or does it fit with the, the core player experience and the pillars? Uh, if not, Maybe it doesn't fit here. Maybe we need to. That's for a separate, uh, for another game, or it's uh, it's for the sequel where we have planned to do our game about uh, not bananas but uh, throwing uh, apples instead. So uh, yeah, figuring out those core pillars and, and player experiences will help you manage scope. And then uh, we can help. Team, the team create clear deliverables that allows you to plan and estimate and then track your progress towards shipping. Just have to double check my time. Um, and that brings me to the milestone uh, milestones that you have. So in your game, you will have milestones. They should be digestible pieces. So the team needs to sign off. We can deliver this. This seems like a reasonable uh, milestone for us. We have to have a clear expectation of outcome. One of the, the things that often goes wrong is that the, the team might have different expectations of what we're making or what we're delivering for a milestone. That creates conflict and creates confusion, and, and we want to make sure we have those very clear before we, we start that. Um, and that also goes for any external stakeholders that we might, able, might be playing your game. So let's say you're working with a producer. Make sure you work with the producer and, and communicate clear expectations of what you are delivering for this milestone or what the game is going to be, what the core, uh, core player experiences are. Managing expectations is a lot of what a producer also does and uh, something a team needs to be good at as a, as a whole. Uh, I talked a little bit about it now. Um, one thing that could be useful for milestones, and I kind of recommend we did that for Among the Sleep, a few times, is having external stakeholders when you, when you do milestones. So let's say you put a milestone, and then at the end of the milestone, you have planned out, uh, we're going to have 20 people over for testing, and they're going to test this. That will help you as a team focus towards this milestone and being held accountable for delivering something at that milestone. And if if you can't, then maybe you'll have to then manage the expectations of those who are testing and then, and then discuss that. But it, it's a useful tool. And having a closing plan, because we all know that towards the end of the milestone, a lot of things pop up. You have new bugs that you didn't find. Suddenly, the banana doesn't, isn't a banana. It's a cucumber. I don't know. <laughs> I'm really bad at this. Um, and, and you have bugs popping up and everything. So daily triaging and prioritizations and knowing your prioritization is really important as well. And emotion can also become stronger at the end because you're, you're so passionate about what you're making. Like you want to make that fantastic game and you need to harness that passion in towards something good. So as a team, uh, making sure you're, you're 
everybody's helping the team and the producer is helping the team focusing on what, where, what's the longer term vision and then if something falls off the wagon for this milestone, how can we fit it into the next? Like, and then and then focusing on what we're actually, uh, what's working well in this this milestone and this this release is uh, can be really powerful. Uh, moving on, so I want to deep uh, dig uh, a little bit deeper, just uh, um, for insight into how one pre-production would look like, for example. This is kind of how we work in, in Funcom um, in a way, but let's say you have one pre-production. It can be, let's say that, that's, I don't know, half a year or seven, eight months of, of development. And having one like big milestone at the end would be, uh, it, it becomes hard to manage. So dividing that pre-production phase up into smaller releases uh, is probably uh, smart for you to do as well. And then you can also take that like final goal that you're aiming for at the end and start breaking that up backwards and looking at, okay, so if this is where we want to be, where do we have to be halfway there or where we have to be 75% there and kind of figure out where things land. And then since you kind of identified your risks, you can also look at where your risks should be addressed in this as well. And then you can break that down further into sprints, but I'm not going to go too deep into that. Uh, in Funcom, we work in sprints uh, of two weeks, and for us, that's uh, uh, it gives us a good amount of time to work on a chunk of uh, stuff, uh, and then some time at the end to uh, look back and see what we actually managed to do, So, and then possibly course correct a little bit more often. But yeah, I'm not going to go too deep into that. So a little bit about prioritization and estimation. Uh, so the further into the future, the harder it is to be accurate when you're planning. And that's fine. Accepting this is uh, your first step uh, to becoming good at estimation. It's, it's fine that you, at least in the beginning, uh, and I mean, cone of uncertainty tells you that in the beginning, you're not going to be able to tell how much time it takes because there's so many unknowns. But the less unknowns you have, uh, the more uh, accurate you, you can be in the planning. And then for the, for the long-term future, uh, it doesn't really matter. You can put down some rough bullet points. The more, it's more important for you to know the core player experiences and the pillars of your game to be able to deliver. And then you can have some rough, very rough estimations, like weeks or months on different aspects when you go further in. For prioritization, this can be a super useful uh, exercise. So something we did on our game Dune Awakening is that we set up a uh, mirror board and we have our must-haves, should-haves, nice-to-haves uh, for the, the stuff that we're working on. So uh, it allows you to, to be a bit more rational about and pragmatic about uh, uh, what uh, doesn't make it and what, what we should uh, absolutely prior prioritize. So you would have those as different boxes and you would move things around and, and kind of agree on where, where things land. And you could also start identifying your dependencies. So this feature will be dependent on this feature and all that stuff. And then knowing your global priorities. In, uh, in Funcom, I've never done this before. I got to Funcom, but it's super cool. We have a, a list, which are, is our global priorities of everything in the game. I mean, everything, every feature, every piece of content, everything. Uh, and it's something that we kind of continuously work on updating. And it helps us ask the questions, uh, or it makes it easier to answer questions when you uh, have anything come up that you didn't expect. So if suddenly this uh, feature doesn't work out, can we, can we cut it? Or if we have to spend, if we have to reprioritize what falls off the, the wagon, basically. And knowing when to break down work. So maybe. If you're doing uh, this uh, physics-based banana fighter game, and uh, this game is going to be like uh, uh, Needhog and have like 100 levels, um, maybe you don't need to, to break down the work for uh, the, I don't know, that was a bad example actually, but yeah, like the, the, you don't have to break down the work for your 50 levels down the time down the road. You just need to focus on the first, the ones that you're you're looking at now, or maybe those can be uh, broken down later. 
And then estimating in store points versus time. So we find it often easier, at least in the beginning, to do like rough estimates in time for, for future ones. But now we've been starting to use store points more and more uh, in Funcom as well. And they're super useful. I'm not going to go into them here, but uh, it, it allows you to have a little bit uh, more uh, flexible uh, relationship to estimating. And um, yeah, defining expected outcome in Funcom, we also use user stories and acceptance criteria. So the designers will work in user stories, and that helps you understand what the player is to uh, the player experience is from this and helps align the designer, the programmer, the artist, the audio, the VFX people on what they're making uh, and how that, that's going to exper be experienced from the user's perspective. It's really useful. Uh, and then you need to know your team composition and capacity, uh, have done your capacity planning. So if you have 10 people uh, working on this project, uh, how many are programmers, how many are designers, how many are audio, art, etc., and how much time do they have factoring and vacation, all that stuff. But these can be very rough numbers to begin with. And that's, I think, the thing that people, uh, or at least me personally, have, have felt have been most difficult when I do estimations and planning is that I don't have this information. How, do, how the hell am I going to be able to set like a number of weeks on this? But you work with your team and you figure out this together and you, you're okay with estimates being inaccurate or being rough or being a first pass. And then you uh, continue doing that later. And that's where rolling planning and scoping comes in. So plans are nothing, planning is everything. It's so true. So don't stress about making the perfect plan, but make sure you set up a recurring meeting where you do your roadmap reviews and, and look at the roadmaps together. Accept change and iteration because it's just in the nat natural process of making games. Uh, so you do regular roadmaps, uh, roadmap reviews with uh, relevant stakeholders. So figure out who those relevant stakeholders are as well. Uh, and roadmaps should be visible and communicated to everyone on the team and everyone who's, uh, who should be seeing them. This is super important because, uh, uh, yeah, they, they need to know when deadlines are coming and they need to know uh, what is expected from this and this delivery. So a little bit about benchmarks. We do this at, Fun at Funcom. So um, in, in a huge uh, open uh, world game, uh, like we're making, uh, it's, it's kind of hard sometimes to make a good vertical slice. So instead, we, we tend to land on benchmarks. Uh, and benchmarks are basically a piece of the game made to shippable quality. But it doesn't need to be a full slice of the experience. It can be different aspects. So we might want to benchmark anything that you will have uh, more of. So figuring out your benchmarks uh, is really important. And then uh, let's say you're making 20 dungeons. OK, how much time does it take to make one dungeon to shippable quality? Uh, and that will be your benchmark for dun dungeons, or guns, or cars, or levels, or whatever it is that you need. And it allows you, yeah, as I said, it allows you to uh, see how much time it takes to create one out of, and then how much it takes to make the total. And then aligning on target quality and direction, it can help you do that as well, because now you will actually kind of help set the art direction and the direction for everything uh, by delivering that full quality. Uh, doesn't it continue? Yeah, okay. Uh, and aligning on quality and aligning on expectations also brings me to tiers of completion. This was something I never worked with before I got to uh, Red Thread and Funcom, uh, but it's been super useful in, in both of those game productions. So what is uh, the most common, uh, most common mistake I see uh, and I've done myself is, okay, I'll, I'll take a feature uh, and I really like it, so we'll spend a lot of time uh, adding polish and making it really nice and smooth and everything. Uh, but then you realize this is not what, what the game needed or this has to change completely. And now you have to do all that time polishing it again. So instead of doing that, you want to work horizontally and then do uh, uh, vertical uh, improvements. So aligning on expectations for each of these tiers, uh, what do you expect from a tier one? 
Uh, and in front com, a tier one would be uh, usually be finding the fun. So this is where we have a bit of time experimenting, finding the fun of a feature, figuring out uh, uh, what works and doesn't work. And you would probably not move on from here before you've kind of agreed on, okay, this, this, this works, this is fun. I can uh, slap this person with a banana now, it's awesome. Um, and then, uh, then you can agree on, on the tier two and tier three uh, uh, implementation tiers as well. And these examples, you can feel free to use them. Like tier two would be fully playable here, for example, and tier three would be shippable, so at a higher quality. And then what does that mean for design? What does that mean for code? What does that mean for art, for example? So tier one, maybe you don't need a fully rigged and awesome looking asset. Maybe it's fine to have something gray boxy. So then, then, then you agree on that. What this also allows you to do is get better feedback and less frustration. So, because the team now, the team is now aligned on, okay, I uh, when the when the teams when somebody's coming over and playing this on a programmer's desk, they're not there to give feedback on on uh, this doesn't have uh, VFX or audio because we agreed that we're not we're delivering tier one now. Then we move on, and also for external stakeholders, if you need to communicate that. And then manage and balance uh, investments in different aspects of the feature. Um, so you spend less time wasted on polishing something that will change. In Funcom, we also do something called our gold, silver, and bronzes, which is something where in Funcom our directors would help define what is, what are, your, what are your goals in this game production? So what is the standout features which might go beyond tier three where we need to polish and add some extra extra love to them to make them shine. So in a game production, you might want to have like 10% gold, 30% silver, 60% bronze features, for example, just as a natural distribution to be able to give uh, enough focus to the gold. Um, yeah, and you would do this for uh, an overall for the entire feature and then per discipline. And then knowing your burn downs, when everything, when you start working on this, I don't know, does anybody here do burn down charts on their production? One hand, nice, two hands. Yeah, there's some, some people doing it. Awesome. Um, so having done your estimations, this is going to be super easy. You just make a, a graph in Excel or in whatever tool you're doing, and you kind of, kind of see, since you've assigned things to the right milestones and everything, you kind of see, OK, how are we progressing towards that uh, milestone? And then you can see when that graph where you see here, it's the red one is, the blue one is ideal and the red one is where you are. When you see the red one going up again, you might want to address that and manage the scope and then make sure you're on target to delivering again. So uh, yeah, it helps us understand the remaining scope and deliver on time. Uh, and it has dependencies on having done your planning and knowing your velocity. And Funcom, as, we, as I said, we use story points now. So every sprint, everything we, we do, we have a velocity for. So that will be like the last three sprints. We have an average velocity of just uh, 100 points or whatever. And then you can say, if you've done some estimations, even rough ones, on the future work, uh, you would know where, where you're heading if your total uh, milestone uh, scope is 1,000 points and you do 100 per sprint, then it'll take you um, uh, 10 sprints to do it, right? Um, and then the better planning, uh, the more uh, value from the burndown. And you can do the burndown on different metrics. You can do it on store points, time estimates. But you could also do it on, like, if you, if you're not have, if you don't have the capacity to do planning that deep, you can do it on features level, assets left, anything you want. Whatever makes sense. Um, and it creates visibility on on uh, on if we're landing for the time, uh, landing in time, and it helps the team understand uh, when we need to start cutting and moving things around. This needs to be triaged on a regular basis. Super important. And then you have uh, when things go really uh, really bad, and you have stuff not working in the game. Uh, you have the concept of strike teams that we do use at Funcom as well. It can be a, uh, a useful tool for you to focus in on something. We used it at, at Red Thread as well. So you could have, 
a high-risk feature or technical challenge, and then Strike Team allows you to focus in on solving those problems. So you would have buggy combat, Strike Team. Engine upgrade, Strike Team. Visual improvements, Strike Team. We're going to do a trailer. It needs to look amazing, Strike Team. We have 10 FPS, Strike Team. Problem solved. <laughs> but it's, uh, of course, so um, when you have a bigger team, uh, it's probably easier because if you're, in a small, if you're a small enough team, the strike team would probably be the entire team. But, um, but even at Red Thread Games, we use strike teams for different aspects of the game. So you don't have to be that big to be able to, to use that concept. And as a producer, you're also there to manage stress and crunch. So we need to create trust and com uh, common trust and expectations of what we're there to deliver. Um, and then uh, managing scope is a huge part of that. So uh, the team can focus and not have uh, a sprint with uh, three times the amount of work that they can do, for example, or uh, a feeling of, of uh, like 10,000 kilos hanging over them. Uh, but there's also unhealthy stress and healthy stress. So, I mean, working out can be healthy stress, uh, but you do it for short bursts and you do it for like a, a short period. So balance is important. So uh, you, you want to create that, that nice balance, basically. Uh, but crunch is always bad. So you never want to do crunch, but you want to make sure that the team is pumped and excited about what they're doing. And it can also come from different aspects. Uh, and I think as producers and as just fellow colleagues, we need to be uh, open and aware of uh, uh, that our, our colleagues can, uh, they, have, they have lives outside of job that can affect this. Uh, or there might be things that we, we don't understand and we don't know uh, that is creating stress. And, and, or it could be stuff at work that's creating stress. And, and we need to be open and listen to each other and respect each other and show ca compassion and understanding for each other, so that's really important. Uh, I have a little bit more, but I'm almost done. Uh, risk management, I talked about it earlier, uh, know your risks. So uh, a quick example of that could just be making a quick spreadsheet, which shows your, your risks and severity, likelihood, what the mitigations are, what, would you do, what do you do to try and avoid this becoming real. So you could have a risk that's feature not ready in time, AI behavior is too simple, uh, the players will just uh, laugh at it. Uh, okay, do we need to hire a dedicated AI programmer? Or do we adjust the design so it's not relying so much on AI, for example? It can help you drive priorities and know when to de-risk or when to wait. And what's the mitigation process possibilities? So as I said, just making a risk register can be super useful for you. And it doesn't need to be advanced. It can be a spreadsheet, and you start with row one, the one that you know, and you keep adding to it as you go. But you also need to triage it. And as a producer, you're also going to be working a lot with QA. Uh, and testing in QA is your friend. Uh, our QA teams at Funcom are amazing. I know that not every smaller studios have room for QA, but having uh, uh, somebody helping you out from a QA side can be super valuable. Uh, but if not, then having a, a process for it internally can be good. Um, so you can use it to validate work that is going into the game and help you do regression testing. So let's say you're delivering a build to your publisher. Now you can, can do some, uh, maybe you want to do some testing on that to see if you're, uh, if you're on track. Or they will do regular testing and then you can, can be on top of what's not working for this release so you can plan it in. And then in Funcom we use plas test plans and test rails. So basically you have a test plan for each of the individual features or things in the game and you could uh, and there's like a step-by-step -step of how you would test it so that anybody can jump in and, and, and do a test. Um, and then severity versus priority in, in a testing environment, uh, severity is owned by QA and then priority is owned by production and the team. And not every time you'll be uh, uh, choosing what's the most severe, but you might have other priorities based on your milestones or whatever. All right, I'm getting towards the end. So a big shout out to a few of the books that I've uh, learned a lot from. So A Playful Production Process by Richard Lemarchand is amazing. Everybody should read it. Um, Agile's Games Development with Scrum. It's also really, really useful. Helps you uh, 
uh, with similar type of, of processes and, and structures. And then this is a really fun one because it's kind of interesting how, uh, so 80 20 is, it's kind of interesting how Pareto's principle applies to everything in, in our life and it also applies to your game. So just to make sure that you're focusing on the most important because 80% 80 of the outcome might come from 20% of the input. But knowing what those 20% of the input is, is can be really hard. Cool. So key takeaways, making games is hard uh, and a producer's job is helping the team succeed. And planning doesn't have to be a pain. Don't worry too much about it. Try and get something down that's better than nothing. And then you'll, you'll, you'll start uncovering more uncertainties as you can. And I hope some of these, these processes and tools that we have in Funcom and work uh, that the toolbox here can help you. That would be fantastic. Um, so I hope that will help. And then also remember, you have a common goal. Ship an awesome game and have fun doing it. So you will all work, all work together in doing this. And that's, that's it. Thank you. I don't know if I have time for questions. Uh, yeah, so um, thank you very much, Ulla, uh, for a fantastic talk. Um, so we will be going a little bit into um, the lunch break, but um, I, th I think we can, so you will actually be able to ask Ulla questions um, over lunch, but we do have time for a couple of quick questions we can squeeze in if anyone uh, would like. I know it's always tough, the first talk of the day is <laughs> always the one where someone has to break the ice with questions, but um, yeah, so there's a mic at the front. Where, um, are you able to just sort of take the mic there just so everyone can hear? Thank you. Hi, Ulle. Hi, Matthias. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you for uh, the talk. Uh, really interesting to uh, have a look inside your brain as a producer. Um, just wondering about playtesting. Um, having your target audience test your game early on, later on, and how important do you think that is and when you should do it? Um, I mean, it's really important, absolutely. Uh, but I mean, you have to to know what you want to get out of it before you do it, I think. So, again, expectations. You need to know what you expect to get out of the playtest before you do it, and then you would do the playtest. So, I definitely can be done early on, and I, I would recommend doing it as early as possible. Playtesting is, can be really useful and give you input. But if you're, you need to know what input you're looking for. So as soon as you know what kind of input you're looking for, let's say you have a prototype and you're not sure if this is actually fun, uh, and you want to test if, if people are understanding it, or if people are enjoying it, having fun, maybe you want to do a playtest on that. Uh, but then again, like be clear on the expectations and, and communicating out, okay, this is just going to be a prototype. We don't, we're not looking for input on this. We're looking for input on this. But yeah, as early as possible, I would say. Thank you, Ulla. Hi. Hi. I teach game development at Polka School, same as many of us. Um, so uh, just to initiate for our students, maybe you could pick something from the toolbox to recommend to these early students of game development. What should they start trying with their hands on when it comes to producing? So, uh, sorry again, the question was what? What to pick from the toolbox, what to start with as a student? Um, I would say, um, do we, <laughs> what to pick from it. It's a difficult question, actually. I mean, doing some some of the early figuring out what your your core experiences are and core pillars. I think that's a good place to start, because again, that's that's where your entire game starts from. So, uh, in in uh, his book, uh, Richard Le Marchand, and when they did Uncharted, they had different uh, strips of paper with a, uh, a core, like what is Uncharted, what is the core of Uncharted, and they have like five of those or something like that. That helps you guide your, your way through making your game. I think that's a good place to start, at least. Focusing on the vision and the core yes. pillars. Yes, yeah. and, and then start to break that down. So breaking, breaking that core vision down would be a good place to start. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. I'm afraid we just have time for one more 
quick question, but uh, Ulla will be around. Yeah, so. yeah, you can find me in the other. Sure. Yeah, uh, once again, thank you for the talk. Uh, you My said pleasure. earlier that when the smaller team you are, the more hats you have to wear. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have advice of what you do when you have to have both a producer hat and then also work in the production? How do you balance balancing everything while you're also in it? Um, so when you say work in production, actually making the game, programming, designing, yeah, that kind of stuff? Yeah, if you're a programmer or a designer or an artist, but you're also the producer. Uh, hmm? It is really hard. I've, I've been in those shoes, and it's really hard because you have to be very uh, clear on what hat you're wearing, or, and I don't think I succeeded. So I, I, mm, be, I would recommend against it, but I mean, if you're, if you're a small team, I understand that that will be the case sometimes. I mean, just being clear on what, what hat you're wearing, because uh, as a producer, you will have different you will have uh, responsibilities and be able to make decisions that maybe you wouldn't be doing uh, in that other role. So uh, you need to balance that. And, and then also being clear when communicating uh, why, you're, why you're communicating this. So from a production point of view, uh, you would have, maybe you would have a separate goal as you would if you were uh, programming on a feature. So what is, why, what are you trying to achieve with what you're communicating as a producer? So, yeah, I think that's that's my. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, no well, problem. thank you very much for an excellent start to console. Thank you. <laughs>